the second session of the 2020 Ohio Beef Cattle Nutrition and Management School was hosted by the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team on February 12th in Woodville and repeated the following evening in Newark, Ohio. During that second session, Justin Kiefer, Ohio State University clinical veterinarian, explained why a vaccination program enhances herd health and productivity, the science behind it, risks that might be involved, and the vaccination protocol followed in the OSU beef herds. To conclude, Dr. Kiefer discussed parasite control and emerging resistance issues. This is Dr. Kiefer's presentation. Thanks, Dean. Uh, like I said, I'm Justin Kiefer. I'm the clinical veterinarian for the Department of Animal Sciences. Um, I de- did my bachelor's uh, in the Department of Animal Science, uh, and then also I went to vet school at Ohio State. Um, and after that, went into uh, private dairy practice in Southeast Michigan, Northwest Ohio for six and a half years. Um, and then in 2015, I came back here to Ohio State, and I'm based out of Columbus. Uh, my job is to take care of all of our uh, teaching and research ag animals on campus and the, all the outlying research stations except for Wooster. Um, and I teach in a couple courses, our animal health courses, um, one vet school course, uh, and I do some research. Uh, so I'm on the road a lot going to all of our research stations and their farms. Um, and I, Extension asked me to talk about topics here and there, so I'm happy to do that. Um, they asked me to put together a program uh, for tonight and the previous night up in Woodville on uh, vaccines, a little bit of the vaccine science, uh, what we do in terms of our protocols at our cattle stations. And my, from my perspective as a practicing veterinarian, what I like to do um, and why we vaccinate, you know, um, what should you vaccinate with or what are the, what are the risks, especially to pregnancy. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, and then at, at the second part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about um, external and internal parasites of cattle, um, some resistance issues, especially that we're seeing um, in internal parasites and some strategies that we're using um, and the, the emerging problems in using deworming agents in cattle. So with that, we'll get started. So we're going to talk about vaccination principles. That's the science of vaccines, um, why we give them at certain times, uh, why we spread them out, um, types of vaccines, modified live versus killed mainly tonight that we're going to talk about. Uh, vaccine protocols, these are what we use at OSU, what I've instituted on our farms, um, and then the uh, parasite-resistant uh, problems, um, deworming agents, uh, things like that. This is a picture of our Eastern Research Station in Caldwell. Um, this is our feedlot, newly renovated. We've got some electronic grow safe units. We were there uh, last week doing a sheep embryo transfer project uh, next to the feedlot, and we had a nice snowfall that day. So got about 150 head of calves on feed right now. So principles of vaccination, I wanted to give you a little bit of the basics of the science uh, behind vaccines and how they work um, before I jump into the protocols to kind of give you a background to build a base on why we do the things that we do. So when we use vaccines the right way, um, they're going to provide protection against one pathogen usually or a family of pathogens. That could be bacteria, viruses, or in some cases, even parasites. Um, What's the whole point of giving them vaccines? It's to prime that immune system to fight off infection. All right. when we give shots, vaccines, I don't expect immediate efficacy. I don't expect immediate protection. Um, there's a few caveats to that when it comes to intranasal uh, vaccines, and I'll talk about those, uh, but those are an exception to the rule. Uh, and the same is true for you and your dogs and cats and other species. We don't expect immediate protection. Um, so it takes time for those antibodies to develop in the bloodstream. Um, if you read the label, and I do all the time, and you should too on your products that you give your livestock, Um, especially on the vaccines, you'll read, it says they do not prevent infection. Instead, they aid in the development or aid in the prevention of disease. So they're not going to prevent infection. When you give that uh, uh, Vista shot to your calf or Boba Shield shot, it's not going to prevent that calf from getting infected with BBD or BRSV. It's going to prevent the disease from manifesting itself after that calf has been infected with it. It's going to reduce the symptoms. I'm vaccinated for rabies. That's to protect me not from getting a rabies infection from a horse biting me that's rabid, okay? That's to prevent the infection from taking place later on. It's not gonna prevent me from getting infected. And the same thing for the cattle stuff. Um, And one thing we need to realize that no vaccine that we use is 100% effective. Um, I'm not sure of any in the literature that are 100% effective. Rabies is probably pretty damn near close to that, but there probably is some vaccine failures out there. But we can't assume they're gonna work all the time. And I, I talk about this in my animal health course and other producers and our own, um, our own farm managers. 
you know, this is the host agent environment triangle. So vaccines aren't out on an island on their own. If I give a vaccine to a cow, um, it's not going to be effective um, if she's thin, the weather's terrible, you know, or a mix of these, these, these issues are all bad. Um, I can vaccinate them all I want. It's not going to help if those other factors aren't met. Here's a picture to demonstrate that. You guys know what this is? Organ meat people? It's a heart. Yep, it's a heart. This is a heart out of a heifer from Eastern Research Station uh, about one year ago um, in a group of uh, two-year-olds. We had four or five die, and I finally got to the, I think it was the fifth one um, over there. It's about an hour and a half away, so it took me a little while to, to, to catch one to necropsy, and I like doing that, open up dead cattle all the time to find out what we can, what's going wrong. And we opened up this heifer, and this is her heart muscle here. This is a cross section of the heart. Here's the left ventricle that pumps blood through the rest of the body. Here's the right ventricle that pumps blood to the uh, lungs. And all this black stuff in here is not normal. That's hemorrhage. Um, from Clostridium septicum. So our heifers are vaccinated twice a year for Clostridium septicum. She got two va vaccines for Clostridium septicum as a calf before weaning. She had four shots, and then she came down with this after she calved. Why is that? Because she was thin over last winter. Last winter was terrible, because we got rain and rain and rain and rain, and the cows and the heifers stood in mud all year long. Um, we struggled to get the tractor out first to get the, rain, the hay to them, um, and they burn a lot of energy um, standing in that mud, and that lack of nutrition set her up for this. And our farm manager, Wayne, if you know Wayne, he's kind of a firecracker. He's kind of pissed off about it. And I'm like, hey, you know, these things happen. You know, if we hadn't vaccinated, we probably lost a lot more. You know, we just have to deal with it and accept that sometimes our vaccines aren't perfect and the weather throws us curveballs. So um, that's, I just throw this up there as an illustration that no vaccine is perfect and there's other factors that come into it. Don't expect to, to make your calves bulletproof if nutrition is poor or housing is poor or if they're stressed out. So I usually like to show gross pictures around dinner time, but you guys didn't eat dinner yet. So, um, but it does work on students. So um, I stole this from the internet. Um, this is in relation to people and the measles outbreaks that have been happening and, and other human diseases due to lack of vaccination. And it works for cattle too. You know, it says vaccination, you know, it works. And you know, a bunch of stick figures with rain coming down. It says, hey guys, I don't feel any, I don't need, I don't even feel any rain. Why are we doing this? Just put down the stupid umbrellas. They're bad for your arms anyway. You know, this, this kind of goes to the complacency that we see, especially in people, to not vaccinate and also with kind of the anti-vaccine crazy out there. Um, but this, this goes into the livestock and even the small animal world too, where we just don't get around to vaccinating or we think, man, we just haven't seen a disease. Uh, my cows haven't been sick in years. Uh, my feedlot cattle are fine. Um, we don't need to do it. That does not mean that you don't have diseases present that aren't being passed from cow to calf or from calf to calf. Um, or if you buy animals in, you're surely buying disease. Um, so those diseases are always there lurking under the surface for the most part. And we don't want to let our guard down when it comes to letting, letting our, our vaccine protocols wane. We need to keep up with them. So primary immunizations. This is the first in the series of shots, uh, the primary and the secondary being the second one. We're going to prime that immune system. We're going to create antibodies. Antibodies are going to help the immune system attack the invading pathogens of bacteria and viruses that are gonna cause problems. So this starts the clock on antibody production. The whole point of giving the shot to this calf is to make antibody to BRSV, BVD, uh, Clostridium septicum, whatever we're talking about. That takes time. So from the time that I give this shot to the calf, sub Q hopefully, it's gonna be about 17 days before I see a spike of antibody in the blood. Because what has to happen is that this antibody or this antigen in this vaccine for BRSV or whatever bug it happens to be needs to be taken by the white blood cells under the skin of the neck, travel all the way down to the lymph nodes, they have to talk to the other white blood cells and lymph nodes and say, hey, make antibody to BRSV or BVD. And that takes about 17 days, okay? So there's a, there's a process that has to take place. That's why we talk about distance between the primary and the secondary shot, that three weeks. So the secondary uh, boosters, this is to boost the antibody production. And I'll show you a graph of antibody production, how there's a small peak after that first primary shot, and then a huge one, an 80 to 100 times boost in the amount of antibody with the second booster shot. Um, and like I said, it's around 17 days for that process to start to get that initial bump of antibody. Um, I just usually round up to three weeks or 21 days. And most labels will tell you about three weeks to a month. 
but three weeks should be more than enough between shots to get you a good booster. Um, and keep in mind, if you miss that shot at three weeks or a month later, that booster shot, don't panic. It could be two or three, four months later, um, you'll get a really nice, strong immune response. So it doesn't need to be immediately. How do you feel about these shots that say one shot does it all, you don't have three booster, all that stuff? That depends on what the vaccine is. What, what you're, no, I don't, I don't think that's pro appropriate. Okay. Yep. That's especially with killed. Out, yeah. Know. Yeah, especially with killed. I know there's a lot of marketing that yeah. comes out there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you got to, especially with those killed viral pneumonia vaccines, and I'll talk about that, you got to give those repeatedly. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, there's some that they recommend, like the bacterial toxoid vaccines. They recommend once, like one shot and things like that. Um, and you get pretty good protection. But if you want to get, you know, close to 95% protection, two shots is usually best. So... But that's, that's really dependent on the vaccines. That's a very good point. So I talked about um, antibody production that's going to protect us from diseases. So we've got time here on this axis, axis, and, uh, axis and then the antibody up, up here. And here's where we give the shot. And then we go along time. Here's our initial bump of IgM and IgG antibodies. IgG is the big component in colostrum, if you're not aware of that. Um, and then three weeks out, we give our booster. And here's that huge secondary immune response. That's what we want to see. That's why those second shots are so critical to boostering the immune system. Okay, I, I use this graph in teaching uh, students all the time, and it kind of opens their eyes a little bit to that. You know, why do we give another shot? Well, this is why. You know, this is why I got actually three rabies shots when I was in vet school because they just built a huge amount of immunity. I still have titers uh, for my rabies shot I got in 2004. I have to get tested every once in a while because it was such a big boost. Um, so. Talk about vaccine delivery real quick. Uh, I know it's, uh, we don't talk about a ton of UQA on this part of the talk, but like I said, read the label on the vaccines to what they say. Um, if you're vaccinating pregnant cows, make sure you follow the label. If you're using a modified live and they've had a modified live in the past year, you're probably gonna be safe. If not, you probably shouldn't use modified live in them, things like that. And, you know, what, do, what are we vaccinating with and what are they safe for? Um, store them properly. <clears throat> I've been in lots of barns. Um, where they've stored vaccines just out in the air or in refrigerators that aren't even working that are 45 to 50 degrees or 60 degrees. So throw a cheap thermometer in your cooler. Um, in private practice, we had a cooler just like this. Um, and we threw a, a temperature thermometer in it, you know, all the time to go in and check. Yeah, it's at 38 degrees or 40 degrees. They're, they're cold. Um, so make sure they're stored properly. Um, switch needles frequently. Needles are cheap. You can buy 100 needles for uh, 10 bucks in a box. Uh, please change them frequently. If you have anaplasma on your farm or suspect that, change them between every animal. Please do so, because that's a bloodborne pathogen. Um, but when you use needles, uh, they bend pretty quickly and they dull really, really quickly. After the third or fourth animal, it's really hard to push that needle into them, to just, so just swap that needle out. Um, clean your multi-dose syringes. I'll show you a picture of one of ours. On our farms, we're just as guilty of, of not cleaning our stuff uh, as you all are sometimes. Uh, so make sure they're clean, because we're injecting this into the animal. Um, when we're giving shots in the summer or when it's really cold out, we need to protect the vaccines from freezing or from high heat. Um, this is a vaccine cooler you can buy. You don't necessarily need to spend uh, three or four hundred dollars for what they charge for these things. Um, I think Dr. Boyles makes his out of uh, um, styrofoam uh, cooler boxes. He just punches a hole in it and sticks the syringe in there and we put the little freezer bricks at the bottom. Um, keeps the vaccines out of the sunlight, keeps it cold, and we mix each bottle as we use it. Uh, we use that. At, that's how we do it at the research stations. Um, in the wintertime, if you want to keep your vaccines from freezing, you can actually take those freezer bricks that you get uh, stuff shipped with you, the cold stuff that comes in the mail, and actually warm them up in, in hot water or in your microwave. Don't melt them, but you can warm them up and actually keep your vaccines from freezing in a really cold, cold sub-zero day if you're vaccinating. That's a little trick I've learned. But take care of your vaccines. We want them to work. Here's a picture. This is from our swine barn, not the, the, the beef barns, okay. But this is a pretty nasty rainforest cornucopia of crap growing back in here. Um, and I, first thing I do when I walk uh, in our vet rooms or uh, drug storage areas is look, what do the, the syringes look like? They're usually gross. So I tear them all apart and make sure they clean them uh, or throw them away and buy a new one. But keep them clean. We're, we're injecting this into the animal. It's gross. Uh, where do I like to give shots? Ideally, I'd like to give them in the skin. Is that easy to do in cattle? No. <laughs> That's shoe leather, okay? It's a quarter inch thick. Um, there have been some guns that have been made out there at a few uh, universities to try to deliver uh, vaccines into the skin. Why would it be advantageous to give it in the skin versus sub Q in the muscle? Because that's where a ton of those white blood cells are that are gonna take that vaccine to your lymph nodes. So it makes sense we put it there. 
Um, there are some, I think, mechanisms in humans to give it in the skin. Obviously, we've got thinner skin. Cattle, it really doesn't work all that well. So what's the next best place? Probably sub-Q, just under the skin. Okay. I try to get them that way when I'm vaccinating. Always doesn't happen. Sometimes we're going IM because we're going really fast as we're moving the cattle through the chute. Um, but sub-Q is generally the next best place to put the vaccines. Uh, that's where the second uh, highest level of dendritic cells that are going to take those uh, antigens to the, the lymph nodes. That's where they live. So, um, And then intramuscular is okay. I'm not saying it's bad. But sub-Q is where I like to put them, right on the skin. Other types of delivery. We talked about IM and sub-Q uh, vaccines. We can also have dermal ones, which haven't worked so far in cattle just due to the uh, logistics and technical aspects of it. Intranasals, and I'll talk about those. Those are pretty popular now. Um, and also oral formulations. So if you're giving a first defense bolus uh, for E. coli, that's a way to deliver a vaccine into an animal's oral. Very popular in swine. So types of vaccines. I'm going to talk about modified live vaccines, and I use these almost exclusively on cattle for respiratory disease. These modified live vaccines, they do create infections because they're alive. The BRSV, the BVD, parainfluenza, um, uh, IBR fractions in these vaccines are alive, but they've been neutered in a way. We call that attenuated. Uh, the, way, the way they do that is they take a wild type virus from a diagnostic lab from an active wild infection into their lab and they'll pump it into a bunch of cells that have rabbit blood in it. And BRSV or whatever bug that is will grow in rabbit blood, but not very well compared to beef blood. And they'll do that 20 or 30 times. And after about the 20th or 30th turn, that virus is pretty weak. It's still alive, but it can't cause disease. And that's the one they're going to put in a bottle and sell to you as the vaccine. So it's still alive, causes an infection, causes a dramatic immune response, which is what we want, uh, but it's not going to cause disease. So that's how modified live uh, a vaccine is made. Um, if it's not done right, that can be a disaster. I haven't witnessed that in my practice time. Some of the old timers that saw this with parvovirus and dogs, the first parvo vaccine that came out for dogs, they didn't uh, inactivate it properly and it killed thousands of dogs. Um, bad deal. Now there's a, a lot of safeguards in place, but um, if it's not done right, it can be a problem, but I have not seen that in vaccines and livestock. Um, they really still, like I said, they really stimulate a long lasting immunity, much more so than killed vaccines. We don't also need what's called an adjuvant. So that's the carrier that they use in killed vaccines to stimulate the immune response. In these vaccines, the bacteria or viruses are alive. They have plenty of mojo to attract white blood cells to come in and create an immune response. We don't need any extra stimulus. When we have killed vaccines, like I'll talk about next, we need something to say, hey, you know, to shake the tree a little bit inside the body and says, come in and, and clean up this infection and create antibodies. And that's what adjuvants do. Um, aluminum phosphate is probably the most famous one for that. Yeah. Would it help cure it if she's actively infected? No. Okay. Nope. Nope. Because you wouldn't have time to develop antibodies and protection at that time. If she's, if say she's actively infected at the time you vac vaccinate her, it's not going to help you at that point. Yeah, it's too late. Mm -hmm. There is an exception for that for the internasals, and I'll talk about that. Not for the injectables. Kill vaccines. So lots of products out there. All of the clostridial seven to nine ways, those are all killed. Um, the lepto fractions, leptospiro fractions in these uh, modified lives are killed. Okay. Um, how do they do that? Either by chemical or heat treatment, gently, to not absolutely destroy the organism, but just to kill it, try to keep it intact. Um, Bactrins, they're done this way. Um, toxoids are also done this, way, uh, done this way. A one shot is a toxoid for the leukotoxin that's present in those bacteria, uh, bacterial pneumonia bugs. Um, and like I said, we need an adjuvant to stimulate an immune response when we give those killed vaccines. That's what causes a little bump under the skin, that ir irritation. And then we have uh, the third type I'm going to talk about because uh, Al asked me to talk about pink eye vaccines a little bit is autogenous. So what does autogenous mean? That means just custom vaccine to you. Um, these are allowed to be made uh, by the USDA who regulates livestock vaccines. Um, and they're made from bacterial isolates or sometimes viral isolates from your farm by diagnostic labs. Uh, Addison is one of them. Newport is another. Um, the USDA will allow you to make your own custom vaccines to fight disease. Um, these are not, aren't allowed to be sold uh, statewide or nationwide. They're only custom made for your operation. Um, the most popular one is for pink eye. 
Um, this is at Eastern Research Station last summer. Um, but it's just like a lot of commercial operations. We fight pink eye. It's like everybody else. Uh, this year, we just kind of had enough um, dealing with pink eye. I think we went through two cases of the 500 MLLA 200 this year treating pink eye. We went through a lot of drugs um, and a lot of labor doing it. And so um, we called Addison. Uh, that's just the lab that I picked. It was $1.50 a dose for them to make a vaccine for us. And the whole process is they send me the shipping box um, with the swabs. It's just a cotton swab and swab some active infections, send it off to the lab, and they cultured three different Moraxella bovoculi um, strains, which is the current bug that's causing the most problem uh, in cattle with pink eye. Uh, one Moraxella or Mycoplasma bovoculi, um, and then one Moraxella bovis, which is the old school um, uh, pink eye bug that's in a lot of the commercial vaccines that's really not effective anymore. So we got several different strains and they were able to generate a vaccine for me in about six weeks. Um, so late summer, we got cow, cows and calves vaccinated. I'm hoping this year, uh, within a few weeks here, I'm gonna call Addison up because they've got my isolates frozen from last year and they can produce a vaccine for me in a couple weeks, send it right to the farm and we're gonna start over again. Um, and they can do that year in and year out for you. For so they were about a dollar, $1.50 a dose, no minimums, other labs, uh, have a minimum dose amount that they may require you to make. So just talk to your vet and they can help coordinate that for you if you want to make an autogenous vaccine for that way. Pink eye is a real pain. Um, that's why we went in this direction. That's a custom made vaccine. What is the science behind these? Um, it's, it's still kind of in the air right now. There's some veterinarians, some scientific, uh, at some scientific uh, research agencies that are a little questionable whether they're effective, but there's a strong anecdotal evidence out in the field where we're using them that it does help, especially for pink eye. So the age old questions while you're here, you know, what, what do I vaccinate with? Um, that's the question I get a lot, both when I was in private practice um, and, and also now that I work for OSU. And what do we consider core? What are the, the vaccines that every cow and calf should get? So I, you know, I admitted last night and I tell people this all the time in the cattle business, we're behind the eight ball in terms of guidelines or standards to what we should vaccinate for nationwide. That's the one that we pound our, our fist on the desk and say, they gotta have it. So in the equine world, American Association of Equine Practitioners, you can jump on their website, they've got their guidelines right there. AHA, the small animal group, the same, okay? Cattle, we don't have it. Um, the cattle veterinarian group I belong to, AABP, uh, we decided that we're gonna create the guidelines. And guess who's chairing that? Me. So I'm working with a whole pile of veterinarians to try to figure out what our core is and what it's not. I have my opinions. Um, sometimes it's like herding cats to get, get ideas on what we should put in that document. We're working on it right now, but I have what I think is core here tonight um, and given my years of practice and the people that have mentored me over the years. So what do I consider core uh, for beef cattle? Uh, the, the viral pneumonia vaccines. So bovine respiratory syncytial virus, BRSV, BVD, bovine virus diarrhea, which causes uh, all kinds of issues, uh, parainfluenza virus, PI3, and IBR, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. Those four are core you're gonna find them all grouped together for the most part in those vaccines. Um, and then the bacterial clostridial organisms. So that's uh, Clostridium septicum, Clostridium chauvii, Sordelli, and perfringens type B, C, and D. Those are killed, those are core. All of our cattle get those. And then the lepto agents I consider core as well to help prevent abortion. So Leptospira canicola, Gripatophosa, Harjo, Ictohemorrhagiae, and Pomona, all right? Those are the core and all our cattle get those. Um, what I recommend, do I use killed or modified live for these? I always use modified live for, for far superior protection. Um, in my practice experience, especially with dairy uh, and some in beef, that modified live has saved us from devastating BRSV outbreaks. Absolutely has. We've had, we've had cattle come down with it and uh, not drop in milk production because we've modified them with the modif or we've vaccinated with them with modified live. In places where we've used killed virus vaccines, uh, it has not helped for BRSV. It does not provide protection for BVD uh, uh, PIs, fetal protection, and for reproductive uh, issues. So modified live is far superior in my opinion. Are there caveats to using it? Yes, absolutely. We'll talk about the safety of that. Uh, but in my mind, um, in the mind of a lot of uh, feedlot veterinarians that I talk to in the Western states that receive calves from this part of the country to feed every fall, those calves that get modified live, they don't really have to touch very much, okay? The killed ones, they have to mess with a little bit. Ones that don't get vaccines, man, they're mass treating, okay? With Draxin or something like that. So they love the modified live calves. Um, it's my spiel on that. 
So what do I consider? We'll start with the babies. You know, what do I consider core for calves? So I like using intranasal vaccines. Uh, all our dairy calves get those at birth. Um, some of our beef calves do, not every, every farm does that. Um, but I think they're they should be considered a core vaccine. Um, Enforce or nasal gen three is a new Merck product. I'm not trying to advertise. They don't pay me to, to, uh, to tell you to, to use one vaccine or the other. Um, but these are just the brands that I use. Um, those can be given at birth, very safe and effective. Um, I'm not going to inject this calf with a dose of Boba Shield or Vista or something like that until it's three to four months of age. Why is that? Because of maternal antibody influence. So if we vaccinated mom uh, in late gestation or if she got a modified live uh, before we bred her, she's going to have those antigens in her milk and her colostrum that she delivers to the baby. And those are going to be circulating in that calf till about three to four months of age. So if I inject it with those antigens prior to that, those antibodies, those maternal IgGs are just going to interfere with my vaccine. It doesn't make any sense to give it. So given those injectables to the babies, you know, before three or four months of age doesn't make sense. Um, so when do I start doing that? At around four months of age, um, we give them a shot, then we give them a booster at least three weeks later. Um, I like to get those all done before weaning for the stress of weaning. I want to get those into them because if I give it around, if I give the first shot three weeks before we wean and then we're running through the chute after we sort, uh, I'm going to give them their booster today and then we wean. It's not going to be a great response. It's gonna, that's, the weaning is the most stressful point for any mammal in its life. Okay, so I really want to get all those stressors done, other things that we're going to do to them done before uh, we, we wean them and stress the hell out of them. Okay, get their, their testicles removed. If they got horns, take those off. Get the tags in them. Uh, deworm them. And get your vaccines in before you wean them. Ours are usually have been weaned about six weeks on our farms before we move them into the feedlot or sell them or truck them anywhere else. And they're pretty sturdy. Last year, we've, we, I think we treated zero respiratory cases out of 150 calves. Wooster may have treated a couple. We just don't treat pneumonia. I have the advantage of walking my calves 500 yards you know, from the pasture in the feedlot at Eastern Branch. Jackson sends theirs up to Wooster, you know, three or four hours away. But we control all the vaccines they get and their nutrition. And we really don't have to treat pneumonia for the most part. Makes our calves bulletproof. What do I consider optional vaccines for calves? So if you have E. coli problems in your baby calves, that first defense bolus you can give at birth is really effective. Um, some farms, we have one of my farms uh, at OSU that likes using one shot, um, uh, a bacterial toxoid. I'm not sure it helps. If you talk to 100 vet, uh, beef cattle veterinarians or dairy vets, uh, 50 will say these toxoids help. 50 will say they don't. The science says they don't, uh, for the most part, uh, reduce these symptoms of disease from bacterial pneumonia. I don't think it's going to cause any harm. I just don't see a tremendous amount of data that says, man, they really help when we got bacterial pneumonia in cattle. Um, the viral ones are the ones that are really going to help you. But, um, and then if you have uh, pneumonia problems in your young calves and you're still fighting it and you're using the intranasal Enforce 3, which is a viral vaccine, um, you could try including that once PMH, the Pasteurella, Mannheimia, Haemophilus vaccine intranasal too. It's a pretty nice product. Um, so calves, I talked about this, and I put this graph up here. This is from a dog lecture because it says puppy right there. I don't have a calf one there. But it, the, the concept is still the same when I talked about maternal antibodies. Here's the age of the calf. Here's the level of antibodies. This is when they're born. All that colostrum they get from mom, hopefully. Uh, they ingest it, and it slowly wanes over time. Then we have this little window of susceptibility here. Um, and then as a calf gets older and starts to experience all those pathogens and stuff, and we hopefully are vaccinating it, it develops its own antibodies, and it gets protected. But in this area here, we don't want to be giving injectable vaccines because they're just not going to be effective. Um, I would avoid also giving those, those injectable modified live BVDs for another reason when they're young because they can cause immune suppression. Even though that BVD is attenuated or modified, um, it can still cause white blood cell counts to drop. So I want to avoid doing that to the babies, definitely. So just don't give those injectable vaccines to those really young calves. Intranasals. Uh, these came out. Uh, or at least the really popular one came out when I was in private practice and uh, I started using a lot of it in force. Um, now we've got nasal gen two or nasal gen three. Um, they can be given at any time, as soon as they hit the ground, a day later, three weeks later, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can give it to your heifers, you can give it to your cows, you can get your pregnant cows, give it to your bulls. It's extremely safe. Uh, and Zoetis told me when they rolled that product out, they did uh, 25,000 doses at their farm in Kalamazoo and had zero adverse reactions, no abortions or anything else. 
very, very safe product. If you read these labels on these intranasal vaccines, they're different than the injectable ones. It says provide protection from infection. What does that do when we spray those antigens in the nose here? It creates a localized immunity in the nose, an IgA immunity. It just blocks those viruses from coming in. It's pretty unique how that works. Um, most of them work for about 90 days. 90 days of protection is what they'll say. Uh, but read the label to, uh, to confirm that. Um, I recommend if you're bringing cattle in on feedlot, um, give them an intranasal. really helps. If you're moving cattle around for show, give them an intranasal. If you're taking cattle to expo and bringing them back home, wouldn't be a, good, a bad idea to give them some intranasal. It does help. Um, when we have, when I've walked into dairies and beef operations, we've got raging uh, IBR or BRSV outbreaks going on. Um, I've been able to stop them with intranasal vaccines, to stop them in their tracks by going to the rest of the herd that's not affected and uh, getting our, our multi-dose guns out and mixing up a bunch of vaccines and spraying their nose. I've stopped BRSV in its tracks that way. When all the antibiotics in the world I've given, which aren't going to help because it's viral anyway, it's not going to help. Um, just using that intranasal has been really, really helpful in my experience for those viral pneumonia outbreaks. So that's my spiel on intranasal vaccines. Very good uh, protection and very effective. So we talked about the calves. Let's talk about replacement girls. So if we're going to have heifers, keep heifers back in the operation. Um, what do I consider core for these girls? So let's assume we've got them two doses of that modified live as a calf before we weaned them. We get them big enough, getting close to breeding time. I'm going to give them another modified live of that BRSV, BVD, IBRPI3, okay, Boba Shield Express, whatever you want to call it, um, with lepto and a, and a clostridial booster. They're seven to nine way. Uh, Ultra Choice 7 is what I use. I don't care what you use. Um, those are the two they're going to get. I'm going to give that at least 30 days before I breed her, okay, because I know those vaccines are going to have influence on a reproductive cycle if I get too close to it. It can cause that CL to regress. I don't want to be messing with that. So be at least 30 days out of breeding before when you give that vaccine. So if we have naive heifers, if this girl has never seen a vaccine in her life, um, and the week before you go put cedars in or turn them out with the bull, you give them a bunch of shots of vaccines, their conception rate is going to suffer a lot. So be careful how when you vaccinate those replacement heifers. Make sure they're, they're your own. Hopefully you vaccinate them as a calf. But if you don't know, start the vaccine way ahead of time before you start breeding, way ahead of time. What I consider core, um, also later on in late gestation, after we get her pregnant, hopefully she gets pregnant, we wanna get her heifers pregnant. Um, we're gonna give her a five-way lepto booster, usually lepto firm or something like that, um, and a seven to nine-way clostridial mid to late gestation. I don't need to give her another modified live pneumonia vaccine. She only needs it once a year, okay? I don't need to give it more than that once she's an adult or she's going to be an adult. Um, what are optional vaccines? Pink eye. All our heifers right now at Eastern are gonna get uh, the autogenous pink eye vaccine uh, from uh, Addison. Um, we can booster that uh, with the late gestation shots. So that's kind of an optional vaccine. A lot of producers are going this way because pink eye is such a pain. Um, and also, if you deal with scours and your newborn calves, E. coli, rotavirus, coronavirus, um, or clostridium perfringens, Giving these vaccines in late gestation, ideally at least a month out from calving, is really good to help provide protection to the calf. Um, I'd say between uh, six, uh, four and six weeks prior to calving is ideal. Why do I like that? Because that allows the cow to get the vaccine, generate antibodies, and concentrate it in her colostrum so the calf can drink that. That's the whole point of doing that late in gestation, is that she transfers all those antibodies um, generated from the vaccine straight into the milk. Calf drinks it, helps protect them when, they're, when they hit the ground. That's optional for calves. Not all of our farms do that, uh, but some, well, our dairy certainly does, but not all of the beef operations. So moving on to the adult girls, core vaccines. So it's gonna be the same as the heifer. One dose of modified live once a year. Our cows right now get boba shield once a year, uh, pre-breeding. They also get their lepto included with that and their uh, ultra choice, their seven, seven way clostridial vaccine once a year. That's all they need for that, uh, that uh, pneumonia stuff. Later on in gestation, we're gonna repeat the lepto and the clostridium. The clostridium, remember I said, is killed. So I'm gonna give that twice a year. Don't get as, as much extended protection. With the modified line pneumonia, I'm really comfortable a year, a 12 months of protection with one shot. I have no issues with that. If you're using killed virus vaccines here, instead of modified live, if you're using Vista 
or cattle master or something like that, um, we should give those at least twice a year to those mature cows. And in situations where you're really challenged with weather uh, or, or pneumonia outbreaks, try even three times a year. Because okay? the, killed, killed uh, the killed products don't provide as long a protection. They really don't provide the BVD fetal protection either, but that's, that's just what I think. Um, you remember when we're doing uh, vaccinating the cows, uh, just like the, the heifers, although a little bit less so, you can influence their reproductive cycle. So I like to make sure we're at least 30 days out before we kick those girls out with the bull or we start into a cedar sink. And then what's optional for uh, mature cows, like pink eye vaccine, I consider that optional, kind of like uh, for the heifer. So we're giving it to all our cows right now at Eastern. Um, and then the scour vaccines, like I mentioned before with the heifers, kind of optional. If you deal with the E. coli scours or rota, rota scours, it'd be a good idea to use those. I skipped through my feedlot slide, so I want to make sure I got that. So feedlot vaccination is situational. So for at Eastern, where we feed our own calves, they just, like I said, they just walk down the, the driveway. Um, we don't really give them anything because they've been preconditioned. They've had the vaccines before they were weaned. Um, we don't really give them anything. Um, occasionally, we'll use an intranasal if I think it's going to be a problem uh, for challenge with the weather. But for the most part, we don't have a problem. Um, if we ship cattle to a different farm, they're at least going to get an intranasal vaccine. If we ship them up to the Wooster uh, feedlot pens, we'll probably give them an intranasal. Um, if you buy cattle where the status is unknown, um, or if they said they just got their shots and you have no documentation of that, just assume they're unvaccinated because you never know. If you're buying from the sale barn, guarantee they're unvaccinated. If they poked them at the sale barn with the vaccine, it probably didn't work because they've been off the truck, hauled somewhere, they're stressed out, their cortisol level is high, stress hormone is high. When cortisol is high, white blood cell counts are low. The cytokines that these cells use to talk to each other and communicate and create an immune response are down-regulated when stress is high. It's not a good idea to give a vaccine in the sale barn, even though they do. Um, so when you, you have those situations, just assume they're not vaccinated. Um, I'd wait 24 hours for them to settle. So if you buy cattle off uh, and they come in on a truck, don't try to needle them as soon as they walk off the ramp. Get them off the truck, get them fresh water, get them clean, dry hay, make sure they can find the bunk, um, let them settle down, establish their pecking order, and get their bearings before we start running them through the chute and poking them. Um, I like giving intranasal vaccines to those groups right away, um, in addition to the modified live BRSV, IBR, and BBD, and a clostridial in those situations. One dose of these is enough for the feeding period. I don't need to boost to that later. I'm just going to give them one dose. Um, some people use those pneumonia toxoids, the one shot, uh, the one's PMH, and seem to like it. I'm not sure if it helps prevent disease, but um, certainly won't hurt. Um, but like I said, we don't need to booster those later on. That's, that's my spiel on feedlot cattle. It's really situational on what you're buying. Vaccine pregnancy and safety. That comes up a lot. There's been some marketing, I think, on, on a negative side by some companies in terms of vaccine pregnancy. So, you know, in my opinion, and a lot, a lot of experts, uh, Dan Gimmons is a guy I really respect a lot from Auburn. I think he's the dean at Maryland now, but did a lot of research into BVD. Um, and these modified live vaccines are really essential for BVD protection to prevent that persist persistently infective calf from coming out uh, per to prevent um, early embryonic death loss. These vaccines are superior. They're also better for IBR protection and definitely for BRSV protection in my clinical experience. That's why I use modified lives. But we have to be careful how we use them. We cannot give a modified live to this cow if she's pregnant and not seen that in the past 12 months. We know that's true, and it's, if you read the label, it will say that. You will have a higher risk of aborting her if she's naive, if she's not had that vaccine and you give it to her. That will happen because those vaccines will attack the corpus luteum on the ovary, cause that calf to get kicked out. So using these vaccines and bred cows, heifers that have not, va have not been vaccinated with the live virus vaccine in the last 12 months is not recommended. Don't do it. Uh, in that situation, if you need to get a vaccine, to, vaccine into them, use a killed. And if you want to switch back to live, Wait till she calves the following year when she's open. Shouldn't have a problem. Go ahead and give your modified live then. Um, if we're using a modified live in this girl and she's pregnant and she's had modified live in the last 12 months, properly vaccinated, what's the risk of her aborting if I give her another modified live, her, her, her annual dose? It's really low. It's like one out of 300 according to Givens' data. To me, that's background level noise in terms of abortion risk really, really low. Way more uh, better for me to give that 
that modify thy for that respiratory protection, then worry about that one uh, random abortion. So that's the risk. It's not zero, um, but it's not very high. So that's that's the risk that's out there. That's the science. What the science says. Um, I get this question too. Also, if this cow has just been given a killed, and we're trying to breed her, or she's pregnant, and this calf, uh, we're not going to keep its bull. We're going to castrate and put him in the feed lot. So I want to give him his his calfhood vaccines. Um, if I give him a modified live, is he going to give that to mom if she's pregnant? And the data says that he's not. It's pretty low risk, actually close to zero, that this calf would transfer that to mom if you gave that calf a modified live vaccine. That's what the research shows. So you can safely vaccinate this calf with modified live if this girl is uh, pregnant and has only had a killed vaccine. Don't worry about that. I know some people worry about the transmission. That has not been documented. So questions on vaccine safety and pregnancy before I go on to the deworming agents. Okay. So talk about uh, internal and external parasites of cattle real briefly, um, because we have some resistance problems in both internal and external parasites. Um, so we talk about external parasites. Those are on the outside of the body, right? We have flies, incredibly annoying. We get the horn fly, stable fly and face flies. Um, not only are they annoying, do they take blood meals? They're also vectors. They transfer disease from animal to animal. Um, how many of you had anaplasma or witnessed that in your herds or your friends' herds? I've seen it. We've had it. It's a bloodborne pathogen that's spread mechanically from animal to animal by fly bites from us, from giving vaccines, um, bloody equipment. Um, and these flies can trans transmit anaplasma. They can also, of course, transmit pink eye in the summertime. Uh, lice. This time of year, it's getting to mid to late winter. Uh, we're going to see problems with lice, not because the lice are resistant, because we haven't kept up with our treatments. Our early fall lice treatments are waning. We need to redose. Um, ticks. Becoming more of a problem, more of a problem in the, United, in the southern U.S., but as the climate changes and things get warmer, uh, we're going to have more problems with ticks. There's the uh, argacid soft ticks, black-legged ticks, dog ticks, and lone star ticks. These can transplant anaplasma between your cows, too. Um, and then mites. Uh, Sorioptic and sarcoptic means those are rare uh, diseases that have to be reported to the government if you find them. Um, much more common is the chorioptic means, that tailhead means you see on cows. Uh, I see it on dairy and beef cows all the time. That tailhead where they want to scratch on everything around them, it's really irritating. Uh, that's chorioptic mange. So the stable fly, this likes to feed on blood. Um, it prefers the legs and belly. You're not going to see it on the back or the face of cattle. This is where they like to bite, where they're always stamping around trying to knock those flies off. Um, those eggs are laid in the manure and decaying feed. That's one thing I, I tried to ride on my producers pretty hard and our own farm managers, especially the beef and dairy guys that are feeding calves is take your spoiled feed away from the calves and go put it in the compost or in the manure pile. Because those, these kind of flies love to grow in spoiled feed. You can find maggots in them all the time. So remove that spoiled feed, spread it out in the field, put it in the compost, get it away from the animal areas. Um, sanitation and confinement scenarios really helps reduce the fly numbers too, keeping your barn scraped out. Um, and then spraying the resting areas. Uh, one of the coolest things I saw to kill stable flies uh, when I was out in California as a student that's where I learned to palpate cows. We were sleeping three or 400 cows a day in the Central Valley. Um, I got to go to a calf ranch where they had about 10,000 head of Holstein calves and they have fly problems. Of course, it's a, it's a calf ranch and they were on hutches with three calves per hutch and a little roof. And the flies would bite the calves all day long and then roost on top of that hutch at night. And so they had a employee with a blowtorch that would come in the morning before the flies would fly off those roofs and blow torch and kill the flies on every single one of those hutches. Pretty cool, non-chemical way to kill flies. But um, sanitation really helps. And here, you know, just spraying your areas uh, with fly spray helps, helps cut down on where they like to roost. Um, face flies, another annoying insect. They feed on the ear, eye secretions of cattle. So they have a little dipper on the end of their mouth parts, like a little sponge. It's very irritating and it sucks up all those eye secretions and, and that's the nutrition that feeds the fly. Um, they like to be on the head almost exclusively of cattle uh, for a few minutes of time, then they go rest on foliage and other stuff. Um, they lay eggs exclusively in fresh manure pats. That's where they like to live. Um, back rubbers and dusters usually, in my opinion, provide the, the best protection for, for these two here. Um, we haven't really seen any resistance to the available insecticides uh, with these flies that we know of. Here's pictures of face fly, you know, feeding up in the corner of the eye here. On those eye secretions, big pink eye uh, transmitter, in my opinion. Um, 
if you're using uh, oilers or your rubbers and dusters, force the cattle to use them. If you put them out in the pasture, if you just have this frame out in the middle of the pasture, um, unless they're trying to groom it, that they're not really not going to go in that area. So force them to use it. Put it by the water, by the mineral lick tub, uh, by the creep feeder, um, in the gap between two fences. If you're moving them, make them use it. Horn flies. Uh, this is the probably most important the fly pests that affect uh, cattle in the United States. Um, they like to rest on the back. It's where you'll find those big clouds that you see on the back of bulls and cows and calves in the summertime. Uh, they take lots of blood meals, 20 to 40 times a day. Um, try to stay away from the head and the tail. That's why they, they like to collate in the center of that back. Um, they really only lay their eggs in fresh manure, not in feed. Um, they're a major source of external parasite resistance in the U.S. That has to do with a couple different things. Um, we've been using fly tags since the 1980s or so, um, repeatedly for a long time. So they've been able to develop resistance that over the years. Um, and also they're genetically predisposed to developing resistance due to the R gene that they have. Um, and also we used a ton of DDT way back in the day before it was banned and that helped that assisted this development of resistance over time with this particular fly. So a couple different reasons why we're seeing resistance to uh, um, insecticides by the horn flies. They spend pretty much their whole adult life on cows. They don't like to go onto foliage or other places or barn fences or gates or walls. Um, females are pretty prolific. They lay 400 eggs or so at a time. They, and when it's really warm out, insects develop rapidly. You already probably know that. But when it's really warm out, these eggs can hatch in about 10 days or less. Um, I didn't realize this when I was doing research for this for another presentation, but these flies will travel five to seven miles. That's a long way for a fly to go uh, to find cattle to feed on. Um, here up in Ohio, we're gonna get five to 10 generations a year. In a really hot summer, we get 10 to 12. Um, in the Southern US, it can be closer to 20. So that's part of the reason why we see so much resistance is they're very prolific and their generation interval is short. Um, Cattle, through research that I've seen, uh, they could tolerate about 200 flies without any economic loss. That means uh, weight loss uh, that would see from that. Um, large numbers of flies, and I would say that's a pretty large number on the back of that calf. They cause a lot of hide damage. Hides are valuable. Um, increased heart and respiratory rate. Um, increased rectal temp, so they have fevers. And like I said, cortisol and its impacts on the immune system. The cortisol levels are high in cattle with high fly loads. So horn flies, we've got resistance to the pyrethroid tags and that mechanism of development was similar um, how, to how it became resistant to DDT because we sprayed DDT everywhere um, back in the day. Um, and we've seen this resistance all over the US, including in Ohio, uh, to these tags. Um, how do we define resistance to uh, these tags? Well, if we put a tag in, in a cow, and we see a reduction in less than 150 flies per animal within two weeks of putting that tag in, we're gonna consider that a, a resistant problem. If we're not killing, cutting that fly numbers down to less than 150, we may have a problem with resistance uh, in terms of the horn flies. So here's some management suggestions from the IRAC, the uh, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. Um, maybe wait to treat until they have a heavier fly load. If we're just seeing a few flies flying around, we may want to wait to put our tags in instead of popping them right away. Um, and they recommend maybe more than 200 per animal before we start treating to prevent that development of resistance. Um, maybe only treat animals that could economically benefit. So mature cows um, that are tough and sturdy and bulls may not hurt them as much. But uh, the calves that they're on their side, they may benefit uh, economically from getting that, that fly tag put in. Also waiting to delay treatment um, until at or near the peak fly season. So putting your fly tags in in late April may not be a good idea. Maybe good to wait till closer to June when the flies really start to pop. Um, like I mentioned before, use sprays, dust, and back rubbers, like this cow is doing. Um, insect growth regulators are clarified in those kind of products that you can feed through. If you're feeding those cows or feeding those calves, creep feeding, um, I don't like using those products on mineral licks because I really can't guarantee that they get enough of that IGR into them. So I'd like to just put it in their regular feed. That way I make sure, I make sure they get a good dose. Um, and then in the fall, when the ear tags have been diluted and waned and they're not effective anymore, cut them out. So they're not in the next spring or you do forget about them and they have a low level of insecticide through that early spring that may be affecting those flies, may cause them some resistance issues. When we treat things like flies or, or uh, bacterial infections, we want to give the proper dose. We don't want a weak, uh, a weak tag out there causing resistance issues. So cut the, cut the fly tags out. 
So general fly control recommendations, you know, apply those tags just at or before uh, the peak fly numbers. I would not use combination pyrethroid organophosphate. So those are two different chemicals. Um, what I recommend on our own farms is we either have organophosphate or pyrethroid, not both at the same time. And then we alternate year to year. That's how we typically do that. Um, that way we don't get resistance to both compounds at the same time if we're using that same combination over and over again every year. Um, those rubbers and dust bags do help uh, reduce uh, fly tag or fly no or fly numbers. Um, if you're using dusters, make sure you keep them dry. They get wet. That stuff's going to clump inside of them, and it's not going to come out of the bag. Um, if you're using oil rubbers, use mineral oil or number two diesel. Uh, use motor oil, which I've seen people use as irritating to the skin of cattle. I don't want to use that, so use mineral oil or number two. Um, keep the spoiled feed away from cattle. Put it in the compost and the manure pile. Spread it out in the field. It really cuts down on fly numbers. Um, and if you really have a problem, use those pour-on products too. Silence, the Ultra Boss, uh, we use those in the intense heat of the summer where we're having really high fly populations on our farms, both beef and dairy, and they do seem to help. If we're feeding cattle, consider those uh, feed-through IGRs, those insect growth regulators. Remember, those aren't going to kill the adult flies. That's just going to kill the next generation that are going to come up and, and be raised up in that fresh feces. So that's where the IGR is going to be deposited in the manure. Um, I don't really think those free choice mineral preparations are really good to put those IGRs. They need to be an, an actual feed that they're consuming large amounts of. Um, consider the use of a horn fly trap. I haven't built one of these, but there's lots of extension directions on how to do those. This is kind of an old method uh, where it's made up of a, of a frame that cow can walk through with brushes that sweeps the horn flies away and they fall off down into a trap. Um, I haven't built that, but it seems kind of cool. But it's one of the ways you could non-chemically reduce the amount of horn flies. Um, and then some people use fly predators. We use it at our vet school teaching farm. Um, got to apply those to manure piles, and you got to do it repeatedly throughout the year. But they do seem to help a little bit. Um, but they're a little pricey. But we do we do use them. They're a little uh, a parasitic wasp. is what they are. So moving on to mites. Like I mentioned, we have sorioptic and sarcoptic mange. These two are fairly rare in the U.S. and they're reportable to the USDA. If you do have them, these are you know extensive cases of mange that affect the head neck and shoulders, the backs and flanks, um, very severe cases. We've largely eradicated that, uh, those problems due to the ivermectin use we've had for, for so many years. Uh, Corioptic mange, this is a classic tailhead mange that annoys cows. Um, it's a non-burrowing mite, uh, likes the uh, legs of pastern. Uh, I see it a lot in dairy cows. They get this in between the udder and the leg and causes a bunch of irritation. Um, and also the classic tailhead mange that you see, um, right that crusty area right on their back end. Um, all those mites are going to cause nodules, papules, crusts, ulcers on the skin of cattle. Uh, all of the treatments that we have that are labeled for them, including ipronomectin, uh, doramectin, moxidectin, your cydectin, your porons, your indectables, all are going to work. We haven't seen any resistance issues to mites um, in the U.S. that I know of. Just here's some picture of that tailhead mange. Um, that's pretty irritating and annoying. Uh, you'll see cattle scratching their butt on anything they can out there. Um, one of the producers last night asked about um, itchy cattle actually from lice in his feedlot and I told him that at our research stations and our dairy um, I have these uh, recycled street sweeping brushes. I went to the City of Columbus maintenance garage. They're about a five foot brush that is, has a steel core in it about five inches wide. We just slide it right over top of a post. Um, and the cows at Jackson have broken the first one already. It's been there a year. They wore it into an hourglass and it's falling apart. They love it. Love to groom on it. So it gives them a the place to scratch. Uh, and they were free. It's the best price. So Cattle love to scratch. So you can even do that with a, a broom head, screw it into the, into the wall and let them scratch on it. It's a great place for them to groom. So, and cows like their butt scratch when they have those on them, trust me, so. Lice, about the time of year we're gonna start to see lice is right now. Um, there's five different species that affect cattle. Four of those are blood feeders. Um, in really bad cases, which I have not witnessed, I'm sure they've happened, but uh, I haven't seen it. They can cause anemia from blood loss and severe weight loss. Um, really cause a problem in winter and early spring when the hair is really starting to get long. Um, these are all susceptible to the current products that we have. We haven't seen any resistance to the lice. We get lots of producers that ask mid, late winter, and, and Wayne just asked me the other day, oh, man, that the poron's not working on our cows. I'm like, it's, it's working just because we, we poured them on in October. We need to repeat the dose. It's not because it's not working. It's just diluted and, and, and worn out. We need to give a new dose. Um, so we haven't had any resistance issues. Just redose them. Ticks aren't a bigger problem in, the, in Ohio, in my opinion. Maybe you have a different opinion, but 
at least what I've seen, haven't, I haven't seen big loads on our cows that are coming through when working in them in the summertime. Um, several different species that affect cattle, but it's more of an issue in the southern U.S. and in the tropics. Um, dog ticks, lone star ticks, black-legged ticks, and lots of soft tick species that like to feed on cattle. It's a nice blood meal. Uh, we haven't seen any resistance issues. This is more of a subtropical or tropical issue, but as the climate changes and this thing gets warmer outside, we're going to probably have some issues with ticks. I know I talked to one of my friends um, who was deer hunting in southern Ohio in January and found ticks crawling on them. Didn't have a really good kill this year, good winter kill. And I think that's going to be a continuing problem as we, we move on uh, into the years here as this climate gets warmer. So going to be a problem in cows eventually. Um, we haven't seen any resistance issues here to ticks. They're all susceptible to the pyrethrins, the organophosphates, uh, porons, the ivermex, um, all active against ticks. Um, ticks like tall brush. They like to, like to latch on to the top of those leaves and branches and they stick with their arms out. It's called questing. They're looking for whatever's walking by to grab on and take a blood meal. So if you keep your pastures clipped a couple times a year, that helps cut down on the tick loads. Uh, they like tall grass. So moving on to internal parasites of cattle, got several of those. Ostertagia, ostertagia is probably the most economically important one. Causes infections of the abomasal wall. That's the fourth stomach or the acid stomach of cattle where all their feed is digested before it's absorbed. We can get type one or type two. Type one would be the acute form where we see an absolute invasion of the abomasal wall or type uh, two would be uh, more, more chronic. Uh, Cuperia. Trichostrongyles and nematodirus are all part of the, what we call the parasitic gastroenteritis complex. So when they all team up together, they cause that complex of syndromes and reduction of, um, of weight gain in cattle. Okay. Oop, I guess I went too fast through that. Um, here's the FDA approved medications. Topical drench feed or, uh, delivery. We've got benzimidazole. So we have fenbenazole, which would be your safeguard. Um, albendazole, oxybenazole, and then the old school nicotinic agonists. Um, Levanamisol, uh, which we your um, prohibit, I believe that's what that's called, um, older school, uh, but some people still use that. And then this is probably the most famous category that people use right now, the Iremec, uh, which is your uh, Dectamax um, or your Moxidectin, your Cydectin. So those are the FDA approved drugs out there. So when we look at treating uh, livestock for internal parasites, we have lots of problems emerging. You know, if you know anything about sheep or goats, you know we have resistance problems, especially in sheep and goats for homunculus, uh, contortus that worm. We have places where none of the wormers work. It's an emerging problem in horses. We're actually seeing it in heartworm disease in dog and cats now too. Because we have so many generations of dogs that have been fed ivermec over the years, we're seeing resistant heartworms to it. And it makes sense, it's kind of an arms race. Okay? We're chasing the next best drug to kill those worms. So we need to evaluate how our programs are working. We shouldn't reflexively you know, treat or blanket deworm cows every year. I, we're just as guilty as you guys are. We're still doing it. We need to think hard about, is that sustainable? I know on our horse farm for the vet school, we've stopped doing that. I use eggs per gram count uh, on the horses twice a year, and I don't worm them unless it's above a 500. They don't get blanket treatments anymore because of the concern about resistance. We're doing that with sheep. It's easy to do with FAMACHA scoring of the eye. A little more difficult to do with cattle, but I think we need to think about it at some point, how do we, we get away from these blanket deworming protocols? Um, we need to look at um, how do we find out if we have a problem and how should we modify our program to help prevent the development of resistance? Uh, we know there's problems with, with ostertagia in terms of resistance. Keep in mind that when we have ag production numbers, that's what we're looking at. That's how we determine worm load is the eggs that are coming out the back end of that cow. That's not constant. So as those worms inside of her mature, they produce less eggs. Some species produce very few eggs over a long period of time. Some produce a ton of eggs as a juvenile and then completely stop. It's kind of a big spectrum of production. So, and that changes with age and season as well and host characteristics. So not all worms are created equal in terms of the amount of eggs they create. How do we look to see if we have a problem? So we have qualitative exams, fecal exams, fecal samples. These are what we do in dogs and cats just to check for your hookworms, whipworms, things like that. And if we find, we're just looking for a worm, any worms, right? And we're gonna treat, because we're not gonna tolerate that in our, our dogs and cats. Uh, livestock, we're gonna use quantitative exams. We know they're gonna have some parasite burden. We need to figure out how much it is. That's what a quantitative exam is. What's the eggs per gram of feces? That's the measurement we're looking for. Um, two different exams we've used. I use the McMaster's quite a bit. 
uh, the modified Stolz technique that's pretty sensitive to lower eggs per gram samples. So less eggs in the manure samples, this test is, is better at picking up. Um, McMasters, this is what we use for our horses and sheep and goats um, and, and cattle in some limited applications, um, but it's subject to limitations. So using these techniques, um, we're gonna create what's called an eggs per gram number. We're gonna take a certain volume of feces, add a reagent to it and have the eggs float up and then count them on the microscope. So for sheep and goats, that's pretty easy, right? They have little sheep pellets. Um, their, their feces is pretty concentrated. Cattle, not so much. Huge volumes of feces, they tend to produce, their parasites tend to produce lower numbers of eggs. So that makes the sensitivity of our tests a little more difficult. We're looking for worms. So we have to take some of these uh, tests with a grain of salt. What we're looking to do um, to see if our dewormers are working is a fecal egg count reduction test. So we're gonna take a fecal sample, then we're gonna worm our cows, we're gonna come back 10 to 14 days later and take another fecal sample. And I'm gonna look for 95% reduction in the level of eggs per gram of feces in that second sample. If I didn't get that, I consider that a bit of a resistance problem. Um, but like I said, there's, there's limitations to that. It's easy to do in sheep and goats, uh, lower volume manure, hard to do in cattle. Refugia, so this concept, uh, it's been out there for a few years, especially in sheep and goats. That's the concept of limiting the selective pressure on those worms. Just like we're doing with antibiotics, trying to have judicious use, not overuse them, try to limit the, the pressure to development of resistance. We're trying to do that with, with parasite uh, drugs too. Uh, so we wanna limit the exposure of the worms in those animals to lower the risk of resistance. Um, what this concept does, it dilutes the number of resistant worms or their eggs out on pasture um, post-treatment. This applies to the adult worms in the GI tract as well as the larvae out on the pasture. Um, this can be applied to both cattle and small ruminants. All right. We know that there's resistance to the ivermec and the moxidectin uh, by cuparia in cattle, and that Dr. Kaplan from Georgia has, has found it in the herds that he's examined, and of course that's down south, not in Ohio, um, but that's 75 to 90 percent of the herds are finding resistance already. Um, I was at a talk at AABP a few years ago, uh, and one of the veterinarians there had, had noticed quite a bit and matched um, what Dr. Kaplan had found in some Midwestern herds in the, in the plains. Um, we've also seen some resistance by Ostertage as well. So these things are coming to us. They've affected the sheep and goat people, they're affecting the horse people, and they're gonna come to the cattle world too. Uh, so we need to think about this concept of refugia in livestock, especially in cattle. Um, think about leaving some pastures on your operation where you put cattle that haven't been wormed. They don't have any resistant parasites. That is the refuge, okay? Try not to clean all the paddocks of the worm burns, not blasting every group of cattle in every particular pasture trying to clean them out because you're not going to eliminate the worm burns. You're not going to kill 100% when you pour on or inject into them. Um, also consider, things to consider, keeping 20 to 10 to 20% of the animals untreated. Take the healthiest, fattest, mature cows and think, maybe I shouldn't worm her this year. She's pretty healthy. Do I need to try to deworm her and have her develop resistant eggs that she's gonna drop on the pasture? Maybe I should treat the thinner cows and definitely the young stock that are more at risk. Um, if we have uh, ill-thrift animals that fail to thrive or are thin year in, year out, or if we do uh, eggs per gram counts on them and they're high worm burdens and they're thin, either I should consider treating her then or maybe getting rid of her. Maybe her, her genetics are just such that despite my feeding regimen, she just can't keep up and she can't fight off that worm burden and she should go to be hamburger, okay? Just, just get rid of her, consider that. Um, also avoid treating animals during harsh weather. When it's really hot or super cold, the eggs on pasture don't survive very well, they're killed off. So if we have a really hot temperature or let's say right now it freezes down, you know, five to 10 below zero for a long period of time, two weeks, um, that's gonna kill off a lot of the worm larvae on the ground. If we worm our cows at that time, the worms are gonna die, some of them in their body, right? The, the ones that don't are gonna pass eggs out into our feces and those are gonna be in a higher population than the less resistant worms that were killed off during that cold or hot spell, right? So that's why it doesn't make sense to worm during those extreme weather events when the rest of the eggs on pasture are getting nuked by that heat or that freezing area. So I avoid worming in that intense heat or intense cold, just for that reason. So, questions, I like to throw cool pictures up. This is from Peru. Great cattle handling skills here. I don't know how they tied them up, put them up there, but I like to throw cool pictures up there. I showed this to a picture, this picture to a couple of vets from Uruguay. Last week, they were helping with our embryo transfer. They got a kick out of it, so. 
But oh yeah, oh yeah, hanging right there. So yeah, wrestled them right down. One thing I, I will mention on on the deworming, I took out of this slide. I had it in another presentation. Uh, don't consider the when you pour on the back of a cow versus injector with the wormer to be equal in terms of the blood level of that drug and the efficacy or how well it works. The pour-ons have a little bit of, of, of trouble with, mic, with efficacy because remember, you're trying to get that drug through the skin or actually rely on that cow to groom and lick that particular drug and get it into her, her mouth. Uh, the best way to give it is usually injectable. Is that easy to do? No. Uh, it's annoying. We've got to stab them. Uh, oral, oral formulations work well too, but I'm not going to tell you to go out there and drench 100 cows in a day. That sounds like a chore. Okay, That's why pour-ons are so popular, and we use them too. But uh, when you're using pour-ons, make sure you're using them effectively, especially if you've got scale bars that you're working, uh, using when you're, when you're working cattle. Make sure those are working. Dial up the correct dose and make sure it gets all the way on her back. I've been wearing many times standing on the opposite side of the worm gun. Okay, Don't spray the side of the walls or the floor. Make sure it's gently squeezed so it all gets down onto her back. So. When you're using deworming agents, make sure it gets all the way into her. Okay, my pet peeve. Hopefully, I don't have any worms because it's been, it's been several times. So. But questions on vaccines or parasites or things like that? Yeah. 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 The, those fungal spores can live in wood. Are uh, we have two? to dairy heifer barns where it's notorious. We fight it year in, year out, and we really struggle with it. So, but yeah, it's, it's in the environment. And it's more of a concern for me in our teaching areas because we have students handling them all the time and they can get it from the cattle. Well, but from an economic perspective, it's not a big deal. It's the show calf people that worry. And me, I worry our students getting it and then they freak out, so. But yeah, it, it gets in the wood, yeah. Salt? Like putting it on the eye or feeding it? No, no, that would be extremely irritating. No, that would be really irritating. Yeah, I'm sure it would be, but also extremely painful. <laughs> I believe it, but that would be extremely painful. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. The eyes, you know, of course, is super sensitive. Okay, so I, I would not do that. And some of the most intense reactions I've ever seen is people spraying LA200 directly in the eye. That is extremely painful. So, no, salt is not something I would use. When it comes to treating pink eye, what do I like to use? The injectable pneumonia vaccine drugs. So, Draxin, Nuflor, uh, even LA200. When you give those drugs either in the vein or intramuscularly, those drugs achieve a really high concentration in that eye. You don't need to worry about injecting the eyelid with penicillin or anything like that. I just give them the uh, parenteral drugs in the neck muscle or IV if it's LA200. They do just fine. That's how I treat pink eye. Yeah. 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 Now the market's tough. Yep. Used to be hides are worth a lot more. But yep. Last year he said the thousand market has been paid one Yep. Oh, I believe it. It's a tough market. <laughs> the big plants are making money on it though, I guarantee you that. Oh yeah. Yep. That's their drop credit. They've got volume, man, so they can name their price. They process them right on site. <laughs> so they can they can they control the world in terms of that. So yeah, I understand. I know the rendering we don't we go pay for our hides out of our own meat lab. They actually charge us to take them away. It didn't used to be that way. When I started for the local slaughter plant back home when I was a kid, it went from they were paying us to take all the rendering and the hides overnight when the mad cow came in, they were charging us. It was a dramatic swing and it really hasn't come back the other way. So I feel your pain. Yeah. They got to have it, yeah. Um, at least a toxoid when they ban it. I know some people that give the antitoxin at the same time. Remember, when we're given the vaccine, it doesn't work right away. Ideally, I'd like to get that tetanus into them at least a couple, three weeks before you ban them. But I know it's, that's another trip through the chute, and there's labor involved with that. Uh, but they got to have a tetanus vaccine if you're putting a ban on them, absolutely. Yep, yep. And I've dealt with some wrecks with those before. <laughs> so I saw a guy with some 1,000-pounders one time that he banded. And had several cases of tetanus, which is not fun. So, yeah. Yes, yes. Yep. Anything that gets a ban gets tetanus on it. Yeah. 
Not that I know. No. Nope. <laughs> Got to use the injectable. Yeah. If that would work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. I understand it, yeah, and that that is still a pretty common practice. Where in cases where we know they haven't had any vaccines or the, their background's really sketchy, or they're stressed out as hell, or co-mingled from a bunch of different farms, right. you know, I'm not going to argue against that. Is that a judi judicious use of an antibiotic? Probably not. You know, mass treatment we're trying to get away from, um, as a general rule. But in those situations, you're buying high-risk cattle, I don't blame you for needling them all with Draxin or whatever you're using at, at once. So if you got to do it, you got to do it to prevent the death loss. Yeah. Is that judicious? No. We're leaning towards not doing that anymore. Maybe our management's going to get better in the future, but with, you got to work with what you got. So that's called metaphylaxis. That's what we look at in the feedlot side. But yeah, it can be used. So yeah. yeah. Enforce is not injectable. It's all, only in the nose. It's intranasal. So I follow the label, what, what they say. So the injectable vaccines are going to be geared differently uh, to work inside the body. The, the Enforce is not going to be uh, created that way to work injected sub-Q or in the muscle. That's what you're asking. Enforce? I, we, like I said on that core, we give Enforce at birth or a few days after, and we don't touch them until they're three to four months of age with an injectable. So, modified life. I don't mess with them at two months. So that's that's what we do. <laughs> I probably ship her, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think probably a lot of people in here are thinking that. I mean, I, I'm not sure if it's due to disease or not, or she's just a poor mother. But I mean, if she, at our farms, if they don't raise their calf, they're leaving. You know, We don't have a lot of room, um, and that's their job. But that's pretty ruthless, but that's what we do. So we don't like bottle calves either if mom leaves too. So we try to avoid those problems. Yeah, it, it could be that she's just not delivering class from that calf or feeding it poorly, so she needs to change her career. So, my email is kefer.22 at osu.edu. It's on the, my name is on the front of the slide, and uh, usually respond to emails as fast as I can. But they can't reach me that way, and or can't get a hold of me. Get Dean; he's got my email. So, hmm? okay, thanks.